Well, good morning. How's everybody? I hear some places in the country it's really, really hot. <laughs> and we're left out. I'm hoping it becomes hot somewhere around December. What do you think? Is everybody good for that? Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, for those of uh, 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 the children that are in the room, you're welcome to head out right now uh, for your classes. The students, youth, they're actually staying with us in this service, the first Sunday of the month. And then uh, one other thing, there's, there's something else I want to call to your attention, and that is uh, in order to get feedback that's helpful for us to serve you, we have to have a way that that happens well. And so if you look in the back of the chair, there's a card, it's a connection card. The connection cards are back. Some of you may have mixed feelings about that, but what we absolutely love is when you take the time to take a minute and fill that out. It helps us know how to serve you better. And that is our heart. And so I'm just gonna ask you to pull that out. And before we get to the end of the service, just fill that out. That enables us to serve you really well. We're in, uh, we're actually concluding. By the way, before I get started with that, a couple of things. First of all, I wanna thank you for all of your prayers and all of your cards while I went through bilateral knee replacements. So what do you think? Are they working? Yeah. <laughs> The, everybody told me before I went in that I was crazy. It actually got to me. I thought, what if I am and I don't know it? And so when the doctor came in just before surgery, I said, everybody tells me I'm crazy. Am I crazy? And, uh, and the short version is uh, he said that I was all right. He didn't say I wasn't crazy. He just said I would be all right. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Jonathan, John Iacucci, Steve Otto, Stephen Nichols, Sarah Sigmund, Dave Hurtwick. Did they not do a phenomenal job? Just unbelievable job. So, so very grateful for that. And then just before I finish out this series, um, uh, starting next week, we're starting a new series. And uh, let me just put it like this. There are lots of people, in fact, you might be one of them, who think that the primary purpose of what Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary was for you to be forgiven. And while that is included, that is not the end game. That was necessary for what Christ intended for your life to happen, and that is for you to partner with him in the release of God's will in our world. What's true is that for many of us, we do not feel confident praying, and we do not feel confident that when we pray, much changes. And so we're going to take four weeks. In 30 days, you can go from a person who maybe doesn't pray at all or very little or doesn't have confidence in your prayers to a person who can stand in incredible authority in prayer and have every confidence that not only is heaven listening, heaven is activated. So we're going to start that next week, and I would en uh, encourage you to be a part of it. So 1 Peter 5. Uh, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fe fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. That's really interesting because uh, Peter is actually an apostle, but he's, he's connecting with them as a fellow elder. A witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of the flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert in a sober mind. That's the same, basically saying, pay attention and be self-controlled. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What are we supposed to do? Resist him. 
standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. To really unpack the meaning of those nine verses, we actually have to start with the last two. And it begins to reveal something to us, and that is that suffering doesn't just make life hard, it can make us susceptible to spiritual attack. That our world is not just a matter of nations against nations. Our world is not just a matter of conflicts between individuals or organizations. Our world actually is dealing with a spiritual conflict. And there are lots of people, I would be the first to acknowledge, that don't buy into that notion. They don't believe that there's a spiritual component. But what this passage begins to reveal is that God intends for us to be victorious in spiritual uh, conflict. He, he does not encourage us to run away from it or to pretend it doesn't exist, but to engage it in a way that we come out victorious. Is anybody watching the Olympics besides me? Just a few of you, really. What else are you watching? I'm, I'm curious now. Uh, the Olympics, and it's just fascinating watching these people compete, and, and they go in, and it's just, they, they work so hard for so long, and, and they show up, and, and, and they don't know for sure if they're going to win gold. And, and I absolutely love it when somebody does, and they weren't expecting it. You know, there was one, one uh, young woman, she from Alaska, they have one Olympic-sized pool in the entire state to practice in. And she won gold. And the look on her face when she discovered that that's what she had done was just pure joy. God wants you to go for the gold in spiritual conflict. This idea that we hide out or pretend isn't just less than what he intends for us. It's actually dangerous for us. Position yourself to resist. And here's the thing. This passage also reveals that either we will resist God, God opposes the proud, or we will resist the devil, resist him. Everybody's in resistance mode. Now, here's the challenge with a passage like this for modern people, and that is they hear something like this and they go, oh, sure. Yeah, th this is the problem with religion. It's always so superstitious. It's always so archaic. It's always so juvenile. I mean, there's a devil, and that's what they blame on people who just act outside of appropriate behavior. And what I would say is, if you study human history for even more than five minutes, you'll realize that there's a lot that happens that we have virtually no explanation for in terms of its capacity for destruction or the evil motivation of heart. I understand there are lots of people who basically say that if you have proper nutrition and proper nurture, you'll be a good human being. And that the idea of the devil is just an archaic model to try to describe the forces in the world that we don't understand. What I would say to people like that is that there are people who've had plenty of nutrition and plenty of nurture, and they've done unbelievable damage in our world. How do you explain for that? And by the way, there are people who almost starved and have virtually no one, and they became some of the most generous, kind, and wise leaders our world has ever known. How do you explain that? It's not just a matter of, of nurture and nutrition and opportunity. There are spiritual forces at work. And if we're unaware of them, it doesn't protect us from them. We just become unwitting victims in a battle we don't even acknowledge is going on around us. So we're called to resist. We're called to resist the devil. And so this is what it tells us about the devil. Three interesting words that Peter uses. It says he prowls. What's prowling? If I asked you to stand up and give us an example of prowling, what would you do? And it basically combines two concepts. One is a kind of restlessness. A person who prowls doesn't really still. And then there's another thing. There's a stealthiness. You don't just march out in front of everybody to see. And here's the amazing thing about a lion. A lion is very, very strong, very, very powerful, but it will, it will, in a kind of restless way, keep looking for opportunities in a stealthy way to attack its prey. So this is, he's telling us how the enemy works. Like a lion, he prowls. And then like a lion, he roars. Now, 
I've not actually been in the presence of a lion in the wild when it roared looking right at me. And if I had been, I might not be here talking to you now. It's just how it is. Why do lions roar? Lions do not roar after they've killed their prey. They actually would prefer nobody knows that. They don't want any other predators coming in and taking away part of their kill. They don't, they don't roar then. They don't roar when they're trying to hunt prey. They don't want to scare the prey off. There's a time that a lion roars. And the time that a lion roars, which by the way, is not only so loud, if you are in proximity, it will actually, you will feel it inside of your body. It's like it reverbs, the sound waves just go right through you. And why does a lion do that? To stake out its territory and intimidate anyone from entering in to show any opposition to that lion at all. This is my ground and I'm not giving it up for anybody. And this is what Peter says the enemy is like. He's restless, constantly moving, stealthy, so that you don't see him. He roars to intimidate, and he intends, he intends to do harm to every person, not just believers. Every person bears the image and the likeness of God, and every person is hated by the adversary, and as a result, his intent is to destroy. So... And then he says, devour, that he may devour. Well, that's kind of an easy image to conjure up, isn't it? But it could be a little more nuanced than that. So what does the word devour mean? And uh, uh, there, there are people in this room, you've used this word for something other than lion stuff. Okay? You, I, I just devoured that book. Did you? Did you literally eat it? Of course, you, what are you saying? You're saying that you got so into that book that you, you, it was the number one priority. You didn't want to do anything else. Nothing else mattered. I just got locked into that book. And man, it was so good. I'm so glad I read that book. Or, or people, they can devour a meal. What is that saying? You know, some people, they just sit down and it's like watching a Tasmanian devil go after a meal and just stuff's flying everywhere. Little dogs are happy wherever they are because they, they just know they're going to get something. And then there's other people, they kind of dine. They just enjoy their meals. It's, do we have any diners in the room? Two. The rest of you are Tasmanian devils. You just... You know, in, in our house, there were five kids. I was the oldest of five. There were five kids in our house. We had one rule when it came to dinner time, and that is that you had to keep at least one foot on the floor at all times. You couldn't actually crawl all the way up on the table to get the food. To devour means it becomes an intense priority in which nothing else matters. And listen, listen. It's not just that the enemy wants to consume us. He wants us to be consumed with something other than Jesus. And we fall into this. We keep walking down these paths that make us susceptible. So how do people resist God? He's, he, Peter's really clear on this. The way we resist God, God opposes the proud. The minute we go into pride mode, we're in resistance mode with God. So what does this mean, proud? It means saying things or thinking things or living like this. I can do it by myself. I don't need anyone else. I will decide what's best for me. All of that is rooted in pride. We, when we're judgmental, there's pride involved. You can't judge without being proud. We'll look at someone doing something and we'll say, oh, I, I can't believe that they would do something like that. Why can't you believe that? Well, I would never. Oh, yes, you would. But the minute you think that thought, I would never do that, you have elevated yourself over someone else. And you've put yourself in resistance mode against God. Favor, grace, is available to the humble. So how do we walk in humility? And this is where there's some really 
frustrating teaching about this is as though that we have to put ourselves down all the time to to say negative things about ourselves to to assume that we're we're nothing more than the very worst of creation that God ever came up with how many have ever heard you know uh, 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 there's actually a phrase in a hymn and it's a, it, it goes like this for such a worm as I worm theology just look at the person next to you and just tell them, you are not a worm. You're not. Now, some of you are saying more. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what you're saying. How do we resist the devil? And this is where now what Peter has been saying begins to become clear. Now that we know why this all matters, now we can go back and look at, and what he tells us is, we humble ourselves by learning to walk in submission. In submission. A way to humble yourself is to submit to another. Not easy. Uh, right now we're watching the Olympics, as I mentioned, and it's impressive to see some of the best athletes in the world compete against each other. And what I can tell you is that every one of them has something in common. And it's not the sport that they're competing in. It's not the country they come from. It's not the pigment of their skin. It's not the language that they speak. What they all have in common is they are brilliantly good at submitting. Unbelievably good at submitting. They have to submit to nutritional dietary demands. You can't just eat what you want and be a gold medal winner. You can eat what you want and get into a lot of places, but it won't be the Olympics. They have to submit to dietary restrictions. They have to submit to, to, to feedback from coaches and trainers. Their days are scripted out in unbelievably high demanding capacities. Like you get up at this time and you do these exercises and you do this weight work and you work with this trainer and this is what you eat and this is when you do it and this is when you sleep. Like they go through all of that and it's highly, highly, highly regimented. And then they also have to submit to the rules of the game. I, I watched one person who thought they won the bronze medal, but they were disqualified because they went outside of the rules. You have to submit to the rules of the game. Everybody who wins medals is unbelievably good at submitting. They really are. But we don't notice that because we don't see them doing all of that. What we see them doing is their individuality and celebration after the medal is won. And we go, oh, look at them, how individual they are. They can be their own person. They are their own person, but they've tapped into the unbelievable power of submission. And as a result, they win medals. They're champions. And there is this belief baked into human DNA and our culture that basically says that you don't have to submit to anyone, and if you do, that is how they take advantage of you. The only reason the enemy wants you to believe that is because he does not want you to become a champion, and there's no way to become a champion without submitting. And remember, we're in a spiritual conflict. That's what it is. So we watch these... these uh, Olympians, and we're impressed by them, but we need to pay attention to how they got there. If you are not good at submission, you will lose a lot in life. There are some of us, we don't submit to anything. Someone has advice for us, we're not doing it. In fact, because they said it, now I'm not going to do it. You lose a lot in life. Some people have misunderstandings about submission. They think that submission is surrender. I just give up. Giving up is not submission. Submission is how you get through something. It's a willingness to take on the responsibilities necessary to do, to do well and get through this season of my life. That's what submission is. It's not I surrender, I give up. Uh, some people think that submission is subjugation, that someone else is just dominating and controlling their life. That's not submission. If you have no voice and you have no choice, that's abuse. That's literally the definition of abuse. There's no such thing as submission without choice. 
There's subjugation without choice, not the same thing. So Peter then begins to unpack examples of submission so that we can see this. And the first thing he says is elders us to submit to Christ's example of leadership. And by the way, in case you're interested, and you might not be, but there's one chapter that stands out as the most sobering chapter in all of Scripture in my life. And there's not a close second. It's Ezekiel 34. And I know you think that reference might be odd, but it's the place in Scripture where God calls spiritual shepherds into account for the way they are doing or not doing their job. It's, <laughs> I mean, it, it makes me, like, I think about that a lot because how I do my job, God hasn't changed his opinion in terms of what he thinks is acceptable or not acceptable. And so he tells the, the, the elders, I want you to follow the example of Jesus. And, and, he, and so what does he say to the elders? This is what he says. He, says, he gives them three opposite. I want you to watch over people, not because you have to, but because you want to. That's the first opposite. Not doing it, something because you feel compelled or it's just my responsibility, but because I get to do this. Secondly, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not for what I can get out of it, but what I can invest into it. That's the example of, of Jesus. And then thirdly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Lording it over means acting superior, I know more than you do, and acting in a domineering way. I will tell you what to do, and if you don't do it, you're going to pay a price for it. And some people think that's actually a model for pastoring. It's not. I did not, I became a pastor, I became a pastor to invite people to participate in the life of Jesus, not to control people's lives in the name of Jesus. I have no interest in controlling your life. I find it quite challenging enough to control my own. Um, and and here's, a, I, so here's a little, here's a free counseling lesson. Does anybody want one? You're going to get it anyway. Um, free counseling lesson. There are some people who, they will come to a church and they won't be able to stay there if the pastor says something they don't agree with. And so they'll, they'll, they'll shop churches until they find the person that most likely agrees with most of the things that they think. And it's real easy to think that, well, you know, they just don't want to be confronted with. So in a healthy environment, I can say something you don't agree with. I'm not knocking on your door. I'm not checking you out. I'm not calling you out. I'm, I'm not doing any of that stuff. You know, if you've ever been in a counseling session with me, one of the very first things I tell you is you don't ever have to do anything that I tell you. And I won't treat you differently. Because that's not my job. And so it's easy to think, well, they're, they're just looking for someone to agree with them. I think it's actually deeper than that. I think it's more complicated and nuanced than that. I think that there is something that they want, and they want a spiritual leader to agree with them so that when all hell breaks loose and stuff goes the way they don't want, they don't want to feel bad about it. They want to blame someone else for it. I think that's the thing. Then he says, people should submit to elders' lead in the same way you who are younger. It's not just talking age-wise. Those of you who are newer to the faith, those of you who are less experienced in a spiritual thing, submit to elders. Clothe yourself. Put humility on just like you get dressed. God opposes the proud. He favors the humble. So what is he saying? He's, and this is what he says. Elders, you lead by example. It's not saying... Follow the, the, the bossiness of elders. He's saying, follow the example of elders. They're living out their faith. Follow their example. That's a form of submission. And then people submit to each other's need. This is how we put others ahead of ourselves. This is how we keep unity while we participate in community. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that you're not allowed to have any personal preferences. 
If I were to ask what the favorite colors are around here, not everyone has the same favorite color. Not everyone has the same favorite food. Not everyone has the same favorite place to go for vacation. We all have lots of differences, but when we come together, we're not demanding our preferences. We have a reason for being together that's much greater than all of that. And so you submit to each other's need. You know, I'm impressed. We have quite a few uh, seniors that are part of our church family. And by seniors, I mean people that are uh, at retirement age or older. And, uh, and uh, there's a number of you that are in the room today. And, and this is what I know. The kind of music that we have here on a Sunday is not the music you grew up in church with if you grew up in church. And if you didn't grow up in church, it's not the kind of music that, that was playing on the radio back then. And so, so why would seniors come into a place where the music is different than their personal preferences? And that's because they have great value and, and they have uh, great support for a vision to reach a current generation, not just feel good about the generation they were in. In fact, I think we ought to just take a half a minute and thank all of our seniors for having such a, a generous heart about that. So we're submitted to each other's need. Here's what I want you to hear. If you're not submitted to anyone, you cannot be submitted to God. If you're calling all your own shots, you're not pleasing God, you're playing God. You actually believe that it's not possible for you to get what you want and God to get his will if anyone else is involved. And that sounds a lot like pride. And now you know who you're resisting. So... If we're unwilling to submit, it makes us susceptible to spiritual attack in the following ways. One is it isolates us. The less submitted we are, the less connected we are, and lions always go after the strays. Secondly, it dissolves our authority. The centurion, when he was talking to Jesus in one of the great miracles of the New Testament, the centurion told Jesus, he said, I'm a person under authority, and I have authority. When I say something, people do it because I am under authority and I know all you have to do is say the word and a miracle will happen. And Jesus was amazed at his faith. He said, I've not seen any faith like this in the entire country. It's quite impressive. If we're not under authority, we don't have any authority. When you're in spiritual conflict, you need real authority. And then third, it makes you unprepared for spiritual conflict. If you haven't been submitting, you won't have been doing the things. If you only do what you want, you don't win gold medals. We'll be unprepared when the moment comes. So Peter calls us to, throughout this whole uh, letter that he's written, he's called us to submit to civil authorities. There's a kind of relationship we have with governmental structure and leadership. He's called us to submit to our spouses. And there's a kind of relationship. It's not the same as government. It looks a little bit different. And, and, and we're called to submit in business arrangements. And that's not the same as marriage or government. It looks a little bit different. But the, the process is similar in that there's a call to submission. And, and there's spiritual relationships. And that doesn't look like the other ones. And what he's saying is, is that when we learn to engage in submission in each of those relationships, it's unbelievable how much authority, God's, uh, authority of God can flow into our lives. And that enables us to resist the devil when he comes against us because he intends to. But the purpose for all of the submission is always the same. It is not to hide out. It is not to not be noticed. It is not to let other people get their way. The purpose of submission is always the same. It is so that God's name may be glorified. That's why we submit. So humble yourselves by learning to submit and then humble yourself by learning to abandon your anxieties, and I'm going to have the worship team come out, abandon your anxieties, cast all your cares on God because he cares for you. Now, think about this. He did not just say, throw your cares away. We all try that. Our cares, our worries, our anxieties, our apprehensions, how many have discovered that you try to get rid of it and it just bounces right back to you? And... We spend a lot of time, a lot of money, we try a lot of things to find a way to get rid of some of those nagging, weakening, defeating thoughts. 
And, and Peter says, cast all, cast all your cares, cast all your anxiety, not just away, on him. Because he cares for you. That when I take my concerns, now some people read this and say, well, I guess I'm not supposed to have any anxiety. Peter didn't say that. He assumed you would. And he's telling you what to do with it. And he's saying, don't just try to throw it away. Be very specific where your anxiety goes. I'm gonna cast it on Jesus. You know, Jesus was accused of not caring before. He was in a boat and he was asleep. And there was a storm. They were taking on water. And even though the, the disciples were really good sailors, this one was too much for them. And they came to Jesus and they didn't just say, they didn't just say, help. They didn't just say, wake up. They said, don't you care? We're about to die. And Jesus' response was little faith. I mean, that's faith at microscopic levels. Jesus' definition of faith did not say there would never be a storm or never be a cloud or never be a conflict or never be a painful thing to endure or a heavy burden to bear. He, he embraced all of those things, but he believed his father cared for him. And so what he understood is that God was not trying to make his life easy. God was making him brave and strong to be a source of life to others. And so many times when we cast our anxieties on God, what we're really saying is fix my problem so my life is easy. And what God is saying, trust me with this and you will come out of this thing, not only ahead, but stronger and braver and more courageous and more filled with faith than anything you've ever known in your entire life. Cast your anxiety, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The enemy has one agenda in suffering and that is to destroy you. And he'll use fear and he will use pride in order to do that. No one likes to suffer, no one likes to submit. But Peter shows us that the combination of these two things is the way to experience God's care and God's victory. How many want both of those things in your life? Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, um, there's a lot of things for us to worry about. So much of our world is filled with brokenness and disappointments, painful realities. And we don't have to even look to relationships for that. Sometimes our own bodies break down. Our own minds begin to be frustrated and fearful and we find ourselves just being tossed being rolled and we think maybe we're getting this wrong would you please help us understand in this moment teach us how to submit you're putting good people around us you're putting us in situations where we can be trained to be able to face what's coming against us and we have an option for our anxiety. We can abandon it with you. Because you won't abandon us, we can abandon our anxieties with you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.